five, four, three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome, everybody, back to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY in New York, in Manhattan, Midtown, and it's a uh, another day on planet Earth. It's uh, the day after July 4th, and what a strange July 4th it was. People stayed at home, were advised to stay at home. People had to wear masks. Uh, most fireworks, which normally is there to, to celebrate the independence uh, from the UK, from England, uh, uh, were not allowed, so people couldn't gather. Um, of course, the discussions on Independence Day uh, also went on. Is Independence Day for everyone, or is it for most of the majority of the white people who are uh, celebrating it, but have they really shared all the independence with everybody? As you all know, the significance event that have uh, uh, become the Black Lives Matter movement, most probably in numbers, the largest, most significant and widest civil rights movement that has ever happened in the history of the United States. We just experienced it and we all hope and think that this will be part of change. We see so many flags and uh, posters out everywhere and encourage everybody also to, to do that. But still the situation is uh, complicated. New York had over 400,000 infections up till now, just New York City alone with 25,000 people who died, 25,000, almost a small town. Numbers are up 85% in the US and uh, uh, 130,000 infections since uh, July 1st only. So um, it is uh, 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 really hard, 250,000 new cases in July. And, uh, and uh, most New Yorkers now use the buses. They don't even take the subways anymore. Meanwhile, our president does not seem to understand uh, that science is real, that this is a, a critical moment we are in. He does not wear a mask. Uh, he at some point even suggested that people just should inject uh, disinfectant in their own blood. Um, he put out a support right now that he liked the Confederate flags at the racing cars, even so most states now have said this is a symbol of slavery. It's a symbol of the past. It's a symbol of everything that was wrong when we are a shock. So we all hope this will be a summer where uh, no bad things will happen. Violence is up. Uh, alcohol consume is up. People are at home. The, in Chicago alone, since uh, June 1st, eight young kids under the uh, age of uh, 10 died by drive-by shooting. 340 people killed in Chicago all year till July. It's signed off uh, uh, strange numbers. And of course, COVID, high unemployment, no trust in the government, no trust in the workplace, and uh, domestic problems are fueling um, and that situation. and. Uh, and killings that happened like with George Floyd are the match to really inflate all of it. And we hope um, it, it will be good. Rich people left New York City. They're most, uh, whoever had a country houses there, poor people are in front of soup kitchens here, but life has started again. Uh, uh, businesses have opened. Some of the outside restaurants have opened and we'll see where the artists are and will be. Broadway is closed till the end of the year, most probably till spring. All the companies, the small off and off Broadways are not working. Everybody is out of a job, musicians, actors, lighting designers, technicians, and we don't really know what will happen. The United Kingdom, UK just put $2 billion towards the arts, theaters, galleries, museums, and places for performances. Um, so I wonder um, what the U.S. government will do, especially a city like New York City. And Mayor Bloomberg, the former one, did understand that right, that this is now has become a city of lifestyle where people go because of the cultural offerings. Where are the offerings that are so desperately needed um, to support what makes the city the city, what makes life life? So, um, but all around the world, uh, we have talked to so many people. It's now week 15. Uh, close to 100 artists uh, from all the continents, from all the places, are experiencing this serious moment of uh, corona where we ask existential questions. And today we go back to Africa. We had many uh, uh, talks already from uh, Cameroon, from Burkina Faso, South Africa, and other places. And today we go to the great country of Kenya. And uh, we are here and uh, we have three 
uh, uh, representatives from a Kenyan uh, theater scene, which also looks to the United States. Uh, most countries actually in the world don't look as much anymore as they should be, but uh, there are strong connections when it comes to music, dance, ideas of musical. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, so we have with us here uh, Karishma Bagani, who's a director, producer, a dramaturg, and a scholar. She studied um, at NYU and um, is a graduate of the, sketch tish, of the Tisch Arts, and she has been uh, expanding the art sector in East Africa. And she's a fellow at the Georgetown um, lab um, at the moment. Also with us, Anne Mora is a Kenyan feminist writer. Any wave to us, and, uh, uh, and she uh, fills the world with stories for and from African women to feel them, to see them, to hear them, and uh, to uh, get a, a closer uh, look at it. She's also a novelist and the editor of Shalala Africa. Um, with us also is the great uh, Sativa Nambalier. She is an award-winning Kenyan poet, playwright, and performer. And she's known for her unique dramatized poetry performances, combining poetry and traditional Kenyan music. She was part of the uh, Sundance Theater Lab, the East Africa, the great Sundance Theater Lab. We also had a couple of sessions um, um, with, uh, with East uh, African East African Sundance Lab, so Berta, and Philip, and, and everyone. It was a great, great, great work. And Sitava also works with the United Nations and holds a degree in botany and zoology and environmental studies and also played tennis and hockey in her youth. Incredible, <laughs> incredible artist we have <laughs> with us today. And I apologize for talking so much but you know it's a great place on earth Kenya we have to know what is going on globally so um, let's maybe start uh, with Sitaba where are you uh, what time is it okay so I'm in Nairobi I'm in Nairobi Kenya and it's after seven o'clock yeah oh. it's in the it's the evening it's after seven o'clock in the evening okay. yeah what's your neighborhood where are you in I live in a place, uh, uh, some people may know it. It's, um, it's, it's sort of in between Lavington and Kileleshwa and, um, and Kilimani and Valley Arcade. So, there's, so I, it's, a, it's a very central place. Mm. And it's somewhere I've moved recently. I've never been so central. I'm usually, you know, at <laughs> least half an hour 45 minutes away from everything so it's so shocking to just be you know six minutes it's it's extraordinary for me to and, be living here and and where are you right now oh i am in um nakuru county in joro so i'm in a rural yeah I'm far, sit down. We have so far today. I am, I am, yeah. So I'm in a more rural area. I came here a few months ago um, because my mom stays up country and I wanted to be with her once things started. Just because, yeah. you know, she's in the vulnerable population. I was like, in case anything happened, I wanted to be here. And, you know, the country kept locking down and I haven't had a chance to go back. <laughs> so we've been here. Yeah, uh, Nairobi was under lockdown. You couldn't travel in and out of that county. So um, I'm in a completely different country, more rural. It's been great not be, just being with family. It's birthing season for all the goats. So there's lots of baby goats running around, which is adorable. So yeah. it's, it's really nice. Um, well, rural, distant, but it's lovely. How far away? Four or five hour drive, depending on traffic. Yeah, that, yeah. that is. That is, that is fun. And Karishma, where are you? Uh, I'm calling from Mombasa, Kenya, which is, uh, so we're really, really representing all of Kenya on this call today. Um, right by the beach, I, I live in the old part of Mombasa in, in Ganjoni, uh, right near the Tusks, which is a very big um, monument, tourist attraction site here, uh, but it's also the main road and takes you to sort of a central business district in the country, in the city. So that's where I'm calling in from. That's amazing. And if I understand right, you were one of the New Yorkers who left. Tell us a little bit what happened. Yeah, yeah. 
It was uh, it, it was quite a journey, actually. Uh, you know, I working as an apprentice in the education department at the Roundabout Theatre Company for this uh, last few months, and uh, you know, once Broadway shut down, we had been working from home, and you know, within a week of that. Uh, it was what a Sunday morning, and I was listening to the press statement that our cabinet secretary and uh, Mutai Kagwe gave of Kenya's borders being shut down by the Wednesday of that week. So I called the, the the airline, and I found that the next flight out was the last flight out was Monday morning. So I had six hours. Uh, I packed up my life for five years and six hours, and carried the essentials and got to Nairobi. I booked a direct flight to Mombasa, but I got to Nairobi and they didn't let me travel uh, further. So I had to be quarantined there for 14 days. And so it, it had been, it has been a bit of a, a grueling, traumatizing experience, but I'm so grateful to be back home and um, back in, in the motherland with, with my family, my grandparents, my parents, so, and, and, and my artistic your, community. You left your entire apartment, all your belongings, you left everything behind, couldn't even, so. Yeah, yeah, had to had to let go of a lot of things. Really, just packed the essentials, uh, which basically comprised of my clothes and my books. <laughs> Tells you a lot about me as a person. But yeah, my yeah. clothes and my books. <laughs> it's almost like a, it's like wartime. Um, Sitava, where mm. were you when it when it all started? Tell us a little bit. How was the situation in Kenya? So I I was in Nairobi. Um, when the when everything changed, um, when the lockdown uh, started, and uh, it was really extraordinary. You know, you could see it was like a storm. You could see it coming, um, mm. and the my children's school closed. So I have a child in boarding school, so he came, and then my daughter is in a day school, so so um, that school closed, and you know now we were at home, and you know um, and before that, of course. Uh, there was the panic buying. You're thinking, what 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 will this look like? Mm -hmm. And so I went and I bought tinned food and I bought dried, you know, beans and maize, you know, dried food, um, you know. And then uh, uh, we didn't. It it turned out to be okay. And it's 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 been a very surreal situation. Every every you know, for, for I think the first lockdown was 21 days, and then it became 30 days, and then addi an additional 30 days, and we had then we had curfew. And, you know, you stay in your house, you stay by yourself, you know, I'm staying with my children. And then um, you think, I, I, I had this sense that the, the world has stopped. And then I'd go out and the world, you know, it, it began to get almost back to normal. So although we have lockdown, you know, if you, if you go around now, people are really, um, you know, very active because, you know, people have to make a living. So people have to find mm -hmm. ways of eating and you know feeding themselves so there is a sense of we're just all surviving you know i I, fe I feel like i'm part of the whole world and my job right now is to survive that's it mm -hmm. yeah. when did it start in in uh, kenya when did you have to stay in your apartment it was march 13th oh that's cool it was though. i think it was march 13th right um when when we when the lockdown started in in, in kenya yeah i think it was march 13th yeah 12, yeah, it's been 110 days since they announced it, or 117 days, because I've been tweeting and keeping track. 117 days Ooh. since they announced it, and then it locked. They did the lockdown about two weeks after that. So I think you're right. It must have been there on the 13th of yeah. March. Yeah. Right. And and where were you when 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 it started before you went to see your family? I I was in Nairobi as well. Um, I think my experience was a little different in that I have family who are in a different country and I was about to have a brand new well now I have a brand new nephew and the hope was to go visit visit them um and so our family has been tracking corona since maybe January because we once we saw before it arrived in Kenya the feeling was I need to be a quarantined safely when can I travel if I can travel can I go and visit a heavily pregnant woman and mm -hmm. god forbid i catch it in the flight um so this is before a lot of international lockdowns and and quarantine procedures were put in place i'd already kind of isolated myself from the space on the hopes that if i could get a ticket and get enough money and it seemed safe i would be able to go 
to be with my nephew when he was born and support my sister-in-law and my brother. Um, but then in about two, in the span of a week, everything just changed. So the international borders were locked. And then a few days later, Kenya's cases are starting to spike up. And then a couple of days later, it looks like the city is going to be locked down. And so there was a lot of kind of very panicked decision making in that moment. And like Karishma said, there's a mo those kind of moments that force you to really consider what's actually the most important thing to me um, and how can I do it? So even coming up country was such a tough decision because God forbid mm -hmm. I had COVID and I was bringing it to my mom who is vulnerable and is in her sixties. And the only reason I was able to make that choice was I had already been locked away in my house for about two and a half weeks. <laughs> and I was calling everybody I knew, medical doctors and journalists, just to confirm, does this make sense? Can I go? Am I going to kill her? And you're constantly making, I think that's what's been most stressful about this situation for everyone. Um, and mine was an incredibly privileged choice that I had to make. But I think for every single person, you're constantly making this stress-based life or death decision for going out to buy bread, you know? <laughs> and that's yeah. that's been exhausting. That's that I can't lie has has really, really been draining. And I, I'd say that for everyone. What are the numbers in Kenya? How, how are the statistics? I think okay, right now we have um, eight thousand infections, uh, two thousand two hundred and eighty seven recovered and 161 deaths. Those are the official figures today. Hmm. Yeah. Incredible. It, it seems at least to our ears so low, if you think that only in July hmm. we have 130,000 cases in the last four or five days in the US. Right, right. 400,000 yeah. infections yeah. in New York City. So is your government doing something right? Is everybody listening? Uh, <laughs> how, how come the numbers are so low? <laughs> This yeah. is a Lord question that Kenyan, um, if our know, government is working. will say something okay. as well. This is something <laughs> that uh, I think has been, uh, everybody's, uh, everybody, the West is, I think, surprised about Africa's numbers. Um, and, uh, you know, there all sorts of reasons have been given for it. In some countries, you know, like say, for example, Uganda, Uganda's used to have, you know, has had Ebola. And I know that, mm. and, and I watch them. Yeah react and 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 shut it down really quickly like they they're really good at at um at, mm. at, at having pandemics, epidemics right so they've got a lot of they've got a lot of practice with with it and so they don't mess around right um mm -hmm. you know nigeria is another country if you if you if you read yeah. about what they what they did with it again with ebola they shut it down and really move quickly and very you know really well um and you know so the, the jury's out. I mean, okay, it may be early days, um, but right now, this is the situation, you know, the, for whatever reason, this is the situation. But maybe, maybe uh, Anne and Karishma have got something to add. Yeah, I think, you know, oh, just to ahead, tell Karishma, as you've yeah. said, uh, you know, as you've said, there's, I think, so many theories behind why, you know, Africa's numbers are so different. You know, one of them is that we have a very young population uh, across the board and, and this seems to be something that is affecting the, the you know, more vulnerable, uh, older uh, population. Not that young people cannot be affected, but um, you know, uh, that's definitely one of the factors. But I think for us, I think in Kenya people, the, the government really did a good job, in my opinion, of, of, yeah. of shutting things down early. And I think our president and the entire government was faced with this dual struggle of like, we have a lot of debt and we have a lot of loans. How do we keep the economy alive and then also keep people safe? So I think both those con considerations from my analysis and perspective um, were taken you know, into consideration when, when they made their decision to shut things down early. And I'm actually a bit nervous about what's gonna happen after today because there was a new press statement with our, with our president announcing that uh, there's no longer a cessation of movement between counties, meaning we can go from Mombasa to Nairobi and that, that's now open. open uh, today? So today? yeah, today actually, yeah. as of 12 p.m. I believe. Uh, 4, 4 a.m. tomorrow. Ah, sorry, thank you. Yeah, 4 a.m. tomorrow. Half day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, you know, wonder if that's going to mean that the second wave is really 
really going to hit us harder than we thought, but um, I, I think it's just a matter of us waiting and watching now. How does, yeah. it, all, how does it all feel? You, you, you talked about Ebola, we all know about malaria, something you, you live with, that kind of uncertainty, and now something happens in Europe or in North, in North America, and the world comes to a stop. What are your feelings about this? I mean, I think, I think it's almost impossible to look at COVID. Or let me be more specific. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed how deeply interconnected all these power systems are. Mm. And what that means is what Sitawa said of the kind of racist perspective that was looking at Africa, not Africa wondering why we weren't dying as quickly as we should. There was simultaneously um, in inbuilt um, systems where something that, from my perspective as a Kenyan looking at American news, I'm always surprised by is people resisting the idea of like washing your hands regularly and wearing masks as a public good. I don't think that needed as much uptake here. The idea of doing basic work for the public good wasn't even outside mm. of having gone through pandemics and viruses, it's just not, that wasn't a thing that needed to be educated into people. And simultaneously, there's a lack of real information because we don't even have enough testing kits. I'm not sure if those numbers are 100% accurate simply because we've not been testing as frequently as we should. And yeah. simultaneously, there's been a lot of police brutality that was happening because of the curfews that were quite possibly have made a positive impact, but have led to a lot of violent deaths. More people, I believe last month, died from the police than from COVID. So mm. I don't think it's possible mm. to look at it from, because I have, I understand X, therefore I understand Y. I think what COVID has revealed is because of A, B, C, D, all the way through to X, therefore I can begin to process Y. Um, and I think that's what people here are grappling with and perhaps uniquely right. ready to face because we've, it's never been simple. And I don't think anyone expected right. it to be simple. Yeah. And I just, I just want to add a little bit um, on, on um, what uh, uh, Mora has said. Um, one of the things that's really was, has really surprised me is um, uh, the American response so much of it is political, you know, so much, you know, um, wearing a mask has become a political thing, doing, washing your hands has become political, and the, and you can see the impact, and you don't, and then you have a leader who just got fed up, You're just like, ah, I can't be bothered, so, you know, Frank, your leader, your leader can't be bothered anymore, okay, so you guys are in trouble, <laughs> yeah, he, he. but what's, what's been interesting is also, um, you know, I have a, I have a, my, my children, I've got three kids and, you know, you know, they're kids. So they regularly get ill, you know, tonsillitis and, you know, stomachs, etc. It hasn't happened. So all this time, and I'm calling my friends and asking, how are your kids doing? How's your family doing? And, and I think washing hands is proving to be something that is really uh, an effective thing. And then, and then they're not hanging out with their friends, um, you know, where they get all these diseases that they pass, pass on colds and flus and sore throats to each other. And so that's, not, I'm not kidding you. It's so shocking. It hasn't happened, right? You know, so um, I think we need to really revisit, um, you know, some of the simple things that we've been doing that actually protect us. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's so, yeah, you're so right. You're, it's so interesting to see the interconnectedness and like how all of these, how, how this one thing that we're changing in our lives or paying more attention to is affecting all of these other health conditions, all of these other things that are, are usual for us to fall sick with, you know. Um, but I just want to add, I think, you know, from an economic perspective, uh, being moving from a, a very stable market in the US to an emerging mar market in, in, in the Kenyan and the African perspective uh, at large, I really think this is our moment. I think this will be our moment to bounce back as an emerging, emerging economy and arguably the post COVID recovery uh, uh, will be less, less brutal on us because there's this sense of like we're used to, or the sense of being used to the emerging nature of our economy versus in the States, which is very stable. And now all of a sudden, you know, the main, you know, minting more money, money is being, is being printed. And so, uh, uh, you know, that will really affect the, 
the, the exchange rates and stuff. So I think we're we're in for a very interesting economic time post COVID, where mm -hmm. uh, as an emerging market, it's going to be a very I think it'll be our moment to yeah yeah. So this these are incredible times. The Kenyan government is going better than the United States government. And, and if we tell that, it's right. Uh, now, if you wear a mask, you're against Trump. You don't wear a mask, you're for Trump um, in Washington. So this hmm. is shouldn't be. Uh, it's right. shocking. Uh, it's uh, disrespectful uh, to, to science. It's against common sense. And the basic idea is to protect people, to help people, to make our lives better, that there's less suffering in the world. And America uh, will have to search its soul, and we all hope that uh, the upcoming elections will will change things. Um, mm. You guys all work in theater, so tell us a little bit about how, how's the situation in Kenya uh, in, in theater. Is it stopped? Is it open? Is stuff outside? And what what kind of theater do you do? Okay, I'll begin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll begin. Um, so I used to work in, um, in development uh, and uh, working with the U United Nations, World Bank, etc. And um, 13 years ago, actually, I embarked on, um, I, I got the courage to do the thing I really wanted to do, which is to become a writer. I became a poet. And then that, that was a one step away from becoming a playwright. And so I, you know, I uh, became a, you know, started writing plays, et cetera. And it was, it was also, it was an interesting time because it was um, a few years after the end of our dictatorship, right? So um, I, when I was uh, the age of Anne and, and Karishma, I was living in a dictatorship and um, the, the impact of that dictatorship was, was on, on so much and on your mind because you knew the cost of, of putting one foot wrong, saying the wrong thing um, could cost you your life. And so it had, a, it, it had it, you, you self, you're there for self-censored a lot. And, and I wasn't one of those extremely brave people, you know, so um, I, I self-censored and then soon, you know, shortly after the dictatorship ended, all of a sudden there was this flowering and this, 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 this thing that I wanted to do and I decided to do it. And it was, it was also a time for, for the flowering in, 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 for many other people. So many of us you know, just woke up and you know, started to, 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 to um, pursue you know, uh, our creativity, whether visual artists or you know, theater, et cetera. There was an incredible and amazing ex explosion. Um, so that's been really exciting and it's, it's been growing, you know, and you can see um, uh, Anne and, and uh, Karishma, the younger ones, you know? Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you are the younger ones. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, the, and, and um, you, you know, I just, I created whatever it was I wanted to create, uh, wrote what I wanted to write, which was amazing. A lot of times the, the kind of work that I do is very political. And I, you know, people would say, "But won't you get arrested?" And it's so exciting to know that I will, I will not get arrested. That I just have mm -hmm. the space to to create what I want. So, so there's been the grow, it. there's been a growing, and then and then also the 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 the, um, the infrastructure, the frame, the 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 the, the other things that you need as a theater uh, maker, you know, um, you know, have also been coming. So this program with the musical writing. Uh, program that, uh, you know, Eric Wainaina and um, NYU and uh, the Sundance, um, mm -hmm. this partnership is, is phenomenal because we're going to, you know, we're going to produce 12 musicals like this. Yeah, it had a real, <laughs> real impact. If anybody ever thought what impact does art have, what impact of universities, what impact of workshop have, one can take a look at this. But tell us about your poetry readings. Where do you do them? Uh, what audience comes and uh, what, like, so we can imagine, how does it look like? So what, what I do is I, I write poetry, you know, um, on any topic that I feel like. And then what I discovered when I, when I first started in uh, 2008 is I realized that I discovered that I, I write for performance. 
So then, um, mm. you know, as these things happen, one accident led to another. And I put, we put them together, me and a group of other people put them together and we created what looks like a play, but I, it's actually individual poems. And then I, and then I, I always had a dream apparently um, uh, to, to use traditional Kenyan music and musical instruments and musicians. So we put them all these things together and hired a theater and tried something and got the most amazing response. And by the second show, we were, um, I had taken it to, I had been invited to take it to the Hay Festival. So in the next year, 2009, we're at the Hay Festival and performed in, in the UK. And the first performance is called Cut Off My Tongue. And, and um, it's really about, uh, you know, the things that make, the, 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 the things that make us, the, 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 the challenges that we have as Kenyans, um, you know, ethnicity, our, we, we've, got a, we've got a deep love of land <laughs> and mm. property. And, and, you know, just interrogating who we are, how we become the way we are. Mm. Yeah, maybe, Anne, t tell us a little bit about, since uh, you as Sikaba uh, uh, said, you're the next generation, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? This um, yeah, so it's, it's just interesting. So when you're talking about cut off my tongue, I just flashed back to like the first time I saw you perform. Aki people, when you find the time and when you can afford her, because she should be charging like $500 a ticket, you need to see a Sitawa show. It's mm -hmm. insane. I have never seen a performer who can hold silence in the way that Sitawa does. I learned that from mm -hmm. you very specifically, how to use silence to hold an audience until you're ready to let them breathe again. Oh, I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't deal with you. Anyway, I just needed <laughs> to say that because you made me flash back into that space. Um, for myself, it's, I'd say my first, my first darling love is writing. Like, and like many, many artists in Kenya, it's very difficult. And whether it's because it's a luxury to be a specialist or because we just, African art forms have always been interdisciplinary. It's very difficult to just do the one thing and to say I'm a playwright or I'm a, poet or mm. this i'd say more than anything it's, it's just kind of storytelling and the root art for me i'd say for that is writing so my first kind of performance started as a spoken word show i still have my still on my favorite poems i've ever done about periods just why they're the devil um and menstruation sucks and then <laughs> um from that it just kind of i kind of moved in different writing spaces and i'd always i love I love performing and I love the stage, but it always feels like a second, like a mistress. It's the, it's the thing that after a year, I'm like, oh my God, I have to, oh, I've missed the stage. I need to go back. And it mm -hmm. kind of always pulls me back in, even when I step, I would step away for a while. So um, the most recent, I'd say is years ago, a couple of years ago, me, Alea Kasam and Laura Kumbo wrote and co-produced a show called Brazen, which was, Basically, the telling of the stories of six incredible Kenyan women from Kenyan's history. Uh, it was co-produced by another group um, called Torali for Birds. And we put to stage this, I don't know, Sitao might even describe it better than me, but just a mixed media of dance and, and performance and fictional narrative storytelling combined with this arc, just kind of on stage celebrating Kenyan women. And the three of us since then formed a company, the Lamb Sisterhood, and the entire purpose of which, thankfully to our founder purpose, is that in whatever medium or whatever format, including theater, which is all our loves, um, to just create stories that make people like us, African women like us, feel really seen, heard, and beloved, to tell things that, to create content and stories for them and about them. And so even right now, we're kind of figuring out, okay, we have a, a, a script sitting about periods. I worked in menstrual health for many years. I'm very obsessed with menstruation. And <laughs> we have a script <laughs> sitting that it's called periods period that we're just about to produce and we pulled back on it because we had so many other things to try to figure out. You're trying to make a living. And now that COVID has happened, we're thinking, oh, what would happen if we translate it to a Zoom medium? And it actually fits really well. And I know Alea is working with Sitawa on a production that's going to be staged online. So I think 
I was kind of a ramble, but I'd say my theater practice is just rooted in the why of the story and more the what of it. Um, mm. And I'd say that probably applies to most of the practitioners here I know. Even the work we're doing with MTI, it's telling the story of Field Marshal Mudoni Wakirima, one of the field marshals, aka top two people in the Kenyan Land and Freedom Army, who's still alive, who deserves to be honored, and who has graciously given us permission to tell her story story and so we're so excited to work with Wanja Wahora, a brilliant musician, to find a way to, to honor this woman. So I think all the all my theater making is going to be rooted in finding ways to honor African women. I don't think there's enough of that in the world. Beautiful. Um, I yeah I, I, I started off uh, on the stage and you know trained in classical Indian dance and ballet so we started dancing when oh, I was wow. two and um, that's how, what my first sort of entry point into performance was. Uh, then I realized, you know, as I was growing up that it really became the space where I could just be me without the judgment of society and expectations. And like, I could just be who I was and I was loved and accepted in, in whatever way. Uh, so that went on for a while. Uh, and then I went to school uh, at NYU and realized that actually I'm more interested in the mechanics of how work is made and the behind the scenes yeah. stuff. Um, and I always went abroad with the intention and the desire to come back. I knew that I was not going to create a career there. I knew I was going there so I could come back, you know, to, to give back to the root and, uh, and develop my practice here. So more and more now, my practice has really moved into the producerial, dramaturgical, directorial aspects of uh, creating new work specifically on the African continent um, for an African audience and then a, a global market as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I know Sitawa and Anne, and I have the pleasure and honor of knowing them through the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative, uh, which, which as Sitawa mentioned, was co-founded uh, by Shiba Hurst, Eric Wainaina and Roberta Levito. And uh, it's sort of an incubation great space. Roberta Levito, yeah, the great. <laughs> Yes, the great, the great, uh, a, yeah. a big mentor and a very large influence in my life personally as well. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an incubation space that uh, supports the development of, of new musical work by and for African audiences. Uh, so increasingly, you know, I've been spending my time on the producing side of things, really thinking along with our producing team uh, about what it means to create work during this time. And I think it's a very interesting space to be in because we're a development initiative at this moment. So uh, we're thinking a lot about how do we support the development and creation of work because at the moment it's not necessarily based on production. In, in many ways it makes our work easier but also more challenging uh, because we have to think about the logistical implications of, of being on Zoom and trying to write and develop new work when we're not in the same physical space and energy. So that's, that's been a lot um, of what we've been doing at the Musical Theatre Initiative. And then personally, I've just been really interested in writing and researching more into what African dramaturgy is, what it was, what it looks like, and how it's evolved over the years. Um, and, you know, as, as Mora and Sitawa have said, to, to, to call oneself just a specific thing, an actor or a poet or a poet, or, or, or a storyteller is, is so, it doesn't encompass of the spirit of, of African performance in the same way. Uh, I like to say that in other parts of the world, it may be that um, performance is a way of presenting, for us, it's a way of life. And so I've really been looking into and interested and fascinated by how it has manifested uh, in, in our lives in the past, in our ancestry, in our political landscape, and um, and what that looks and and how that will shape our our performative future. Mm. Mm. How are you as a, as a person? Or how, tell us a bit, if you can. How, how, how was it personal for you? What are you thinking about in these one hundred ten days, one hundred fifteen days? What's what do you feel is essential? What did you learn? Or what surprised you? Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. how you experience this moment. It's been a, it's been such an interesting time. Um, I um, I've got two two personalities. I'm an ex I'm an introverted extrovert or extroverted <laughs> introvert. So um, I love to be by myself. 
Um, I love to be sitting writing, but I also love to be out there. I, I just uh, get a lot of energy out of hang, um, interacting with people. So, so I, I switched on my introvert uh, hat and I'm actually, I've actually been really enjoying you know, this, this downtime. And then there was a moment, uh, you know, probably a, a, like a week or two into, into the first uh, lockdown and, and something lifted. I just, I just realized, oh my goodness, I've been competing with the whole world. I don't know where, what I've been competing. So world, mm. you know, out there, you didn't know it, but I was competing with you. And, and it, was, it was really like a release. Like everybody's, nobody's doing anything. We're not going anywhere. So it's okay. Um, so it was a very, it was, it was like relax, breathe. Um, and it, it then, it's then given me time to, to, to think about myself and to interact with my children and, and, and to do some of the things that, I, that, that I've been too busy to, to do. So I've been reading a lot. Um, you know, I've read, I've read uh, you know, lots of books because I've got a whole pile of books that I'm, I'm one of those people who buys books. And, you know, if I go to a, to a bookshop, I'm buying them and saying, I'm going to read this, I'm going to read that, you know. And then of course, and then of course, again, I've been watching, there's so much to watch, um, you know, whether it's Netflix or it is, you know, documentaries online, you know, listening to, to podcasts, discovering new podcasts, you know, reading things. So it's been, it's been really an amazing time to, you know, to sort of go inside yourself and to start to think what, you know, what is really, you know, my life, my life about. It's also been a, it's also been an amazing time to watch the world. So I've been watching yeah. the world, and you know we are so lucky that that we have the ability to watch each other. Um, and so you know watching the flowering, the growing of the Black Black Lives Matter movement, and then yeah. also watching what's going on in Kenya, like uh, Moraz said about the um, the violence, the police violence, which is so similar. You know, so the mm. things that, that are happening to African Americans in, in America, you know, and then the things that will happen here to, and in our case, if you're poor, you're, you're just in trouble, you know, if you're caught on the wrong side of the law, um, you know, and, and, but then, but then also I feel watching a, 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 a global consciousness, a raising of global consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, as a, as an African, as a black person, of course, um, uh, we, I gain a lot from, from what goes on in America. Um, yeah. and, and, I, I, and I'm just listening to people talking, you know, Africans, black people talking, sharing themselves, telling, telling each other, telling the world how hard it's been. I didn't have to leave Kenya to experience racism. I started experiencing racism. I, you know, you meant, we mentioned I played tennis. When I started playing tennis, it was soon after independence. It was a, it was a white sport, you know, the white colonial sport. And so we were the generation that was was desegregating. So we were going to schools and we were we were plunked into this space without the language, um, and 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 then we had to figure out what, what you know what's what's this you know we had to face the racism our, on our own, um, and and you know we'd go back home and our parents wouldn't understand what 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 was happening because they were giving us the best they were sending us to the best schools which were white mm. schools. You know, so it's hmm. been such an interesting, um, it's been, so I've written, I've actually written a lot and I'm really thrilled that I've, I'm able to do that. So you were able to write a lot? Yes, I'm, 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 I'm able to write, I'm writing, um, I'm writing a lot. Um, I have a show on, t on Thursday um, with, with the, uh, um, uh, Alea. You know, one of the things you'll notice about, about the theater scene in Kenya is we do a lot of uh, collaboration, particularly the women. Yeah. I've realized, right? So, I, I, Anne Mora and I, um, uh, Alea, uh, Karishma. We, you know, there's there's a lot of collaboration. Um, so they wrote a, a a play called Brazen in in 2017, and I was I was given the starring part. You know, I you know I was very thrilled. So there's a lot of a lot of colla collaboration. Yeah. And the performance will be on Zoom or on Yes, Thursday? it's going to be it's a Zoom, it's a Zoom performance. So you're going it's to be at the home narratives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called the narratives are being crafted now. And again, it 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 uh, um it celebrates um African women heroes basically, but also references uh this moment. It references what's going on in the world in this in the in this time as well. So you will be my little excitement. Yeah, so you will be in your <laughs> living so room. Good. 
in your living room with papers in your hand or on the table and you will and the camera will be on you so we're going to it's, it's going to be very much like this um so we're going to do you know some of some of the things yes we will have we do have some props so i don't want to say the props because they're kind of fun so we're going to have some props we're also <laughs> going to ask the audience to participate and we're going to give the audience instructions to do so that they create the atmosphere in their home wherever they okay. are i'm okay. here i'm here in my living room and my my and alea is uh, uh about uh, 10 10 10 15 kilometers away from me in nairobi so so we do it through zoom but you know globally as well yeah great and you will it's a nice idea so you're going to instruct so it's instruction based art people have to participate in creating exactly. things putting something on it you know, i haven't heard that that's good so both yeah. of you others what are you how are you experience this moment how deep did this go how how what yeah yeah Say i said again for an and karishma like what you said how how are they experiencing an and karishma how are you experiencing the moment how deep did this confinement or the the lockdown go yeah i mean my okay my my children are having a very hard time because i have teenagers <laughs> but Ooh. otherwise they're fine okay. but okay so it was it was mora yeah mora <laughs> okay mora uh, go ahead and yeah yeah um so it yeah i it it's not been easy i can't lie for me um and it, m- mostly because i think the first kind of month after it happened was a, there was a lot of up- people's even outside of covid happening in my personal life health like those it was one of those you're like is i don't know is mercury having leukosid again like what's going on like <laughs> is it what is it like it was so there was so in many retrograde. every facet of my life yeah, that one it was in retrograde whatever you know i'm i'm making jokes but i'm <laughs> such a believer in those things but anyway like it was every single facet of my life was having its own upheaval um and so it was very it kind of i withdrew a lot i wasn't even able to read i was playing video games which isn't something i do that often civilization 5 like kind of brought me back just playing ruling worlds and creating settling and creating civilizations was somehow the measure of control that i needed to kind of get back out of that space and then i think about a month after that in term i mean i'm very 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 introverted like by any metric i would I go all my friends know they see me out of the house maybe four times a year like that's just the deal <laughs> so I, so that part of it wasn't a big stretch for me I was like I get to stay in the house again like I always do cool but it was it was more how everything else was up was up um shifted it was figuring out economically like where are we going to make an income we spent a whole beginning of the year with the company making a fantastically gorgeous business plan and strategy and then you can't leave the house we had planned a beautiful theater theater show mekatilili under the stars telling the story of mekatilili wa menza's trek from kilifi to kismayu over 1000 kilometers at over 70 years old set inside a planetarium and it was going to have the stars of her night of the nights that she was walking at that time oh, was brilliant oh. and then obviously there's a lockdown and you can't be in groups and theater spaces are closed you know so it was such an upheaval of everything that it took a while for me to recalibrate it took a while for me to find energy again and i think what's happening now is there's been a kind of shift even ment- i'm trying to shift mentally even for myself from being very kind of big outward driven in Kenya especially I'd say because the economics of creating a theater show aren't great it's not like there's a lot of money and support so there's a way we've learned to produce pretty quickly pretty effectively and put it out in order to get money back in because you can't sustain it just out of pocket but that doesn't work anymore not in this context so learning how to shift into the new context learning how to become driven a little bit more by process than output and kind of falling back in love with the craft of it falling back in love with writing and reading texts right now i'm reading octavia butler cuz she's a goddess and f- falling back in love with the words and how things are framed and we do us thing with the lamp sisterhood um you can subscribe 
uh, called lamb letters. And once a month, we just send a letter out sharing the things that are going through our minds um, creatively. And it's just a free writing exercise. Yeah, you can subscribe. Go to www.lambsisterhood.com, click the bell and subscribe. And then you get um, letters. <laughs> you get a letter once a month. And it's a free writing creative exercise. And we just share what we are feeling in that moment. And that's helped me kind of fall back in love with, you just write a thing and whatever comes out is what comes out and it goes out into the world. And you're not concerned about, will it make money in that moment? Will it win an award? Because an award might get you the prestige that you need. Will it get me in the room with so-and-so? It's just about creation and putting work out. And that's been such a delight. So falling back in love with process, I think has been my challenge for this period. Um, I'm not sure I'm in love yet. I think we are at best texting, but. (laughs) (laughs) As a fellow subscriber, enthusiast, and biggest fan of both Moraz and Sitawa's work, those newsletters, just the the lamb letters, Oh my God, I read the one last uh, th- that was sent last and it was all the feelings all in one moment and I had not felt that way in a very long time. Um, and and I was part of the tech rehearsal. I had the honor to be a part of the tech rehearsal for um, the piece that Sitawa and Alea are working on a few days ago. And it, it's not just instructive, like bringing people together in this, it's something else. It's just something else. It just, ooh, everything, everything. Again, all in one moment. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, and for sorry, me, just, been... and I, want, oh, I do want to say, um, sorry, I just want to say and thank you to you, Karishma and MTI for this. I think the best, the single greatest thing about the Nairobi and Kenyan theater scene is that you get to work with people you stand for. I have been a mm. fan of Sitawa, like a fan, like, like, oh my God, I can't believe she's here. I can't even breathe. And oh. the musicians are like, oh my God, that's Eric Koinaina. And he's in the same mm-hmm. room and he's listening to my, I got no, to sing it? with Eric Koinaina, me, who has no notes, who does not know what a key is. <laughs> and yet I was singing with Eric Koinaina. <laughs> that's been one of the most glorious things. And one of the worst things that lockdown has taken away from us is being able to be in the presence of people you admire so much, who for some reason like you back and work with them. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to say that <laughs> credit to you, Karishma, because of the work you do with MTI. Mm. No, that's uh, that's so real. Honestly, I mean, it's uh, uh, Mugambi, another colleague and uh, one of the one of the participants of the Musical Theatre Initiative, the other day said to me, Karishma, you slid into our DMs. You slid into the Musical Theatre Initiative DMs. Like one minute you're an observer, and the other minute. What just happened? <laughs> um, but I have to I have to agree with you. I think the the level of community and the level of just, you know, I can pick up the phone and call anybody in the scene because I would get that response is just so real. I, I've never felt it in the same way. And it's it's so humbling to be in the same space and, and there's always so much to learn from everyone around you. And um, I really miss that. I really do. Uh, my spirit, I like to say, is in Nairobi with, with everybody there at the moment. Um, because that is to me the most valuable part of our engagements, that we are building relationships that will last beyond whatever projects we're working on in this moment. And that really has been my personal focus in this moment. Just the first part of this lockdown was very traumatizing. And I didn't come to terms with that for myself because I tend to usually just bury myself in the work and know that it will be fine because the work is always going to be there for me. Um, and so I really, uh, I found a lot of solace and a lot of sense of community after coming back and being able to engage on a much more personal level with everybody that I work with. And then most importantly, my family. And uh, it's just been so lovely to be with my grandparents and my parents after five years of, you know, sporadic visits, because it's reminded me of, of where I started from, where I came from and what not to forget. And, you know, I, the other day my mom brought home passports. This is just a moment that I will keep in my heart. Uh, passports that belonged to my great grandfather when he, and oh. they were the British Indian East African community passports that were given for travelers, you know, and settlers from, from India to um, 
East African. Of course, during post colonial, you know, post uh, post independence, you could claim British citizenship if you wanted to. Uh, but that to me was just that's why I'm here. That's why I do the work I do. That's why I think about and reflect and write and research into what it means to be here in this moment and in the now. And that moment for me was why I'm an artist. So um, that's what I've been spending a lot of my time doing, just reflecting, thinking, uh, building relationships and, and trying to be a better person. <laughs> yeah, why, since you are rethinking it again, the attention, why do you guys do theater? What does it mean? for you? Well, um, I do, I do theater because I have to, because I mean, for me, it's an incredible honor. I started this journey of, uh, going into, into this, 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 uh, phase of my life, um, in my forties, I had always wanted to be a writer. And when I was, about 10 years old, I wrote a story and um, shared it with a teacher. Um, my, uh, my father thought it was beautiful. He was like, this is fantastic. So I took it to school and I shared it with the teachers and the other kids in my, my, my class. And they said, you couldn't have written it. Um, and I thought, and I quit. I thought, well, nobody's ever gonna believe me. So why, why bother? And and, and so it was always in the back of my mind. I'm, but I am one of those people who loves to do very many things. So when, so being an environmentalist is also something I really wanted to do, <laughs> you know? So, um, and I, I did it. I, I worked as an environmentalist with the United Nations for, for, for several years. Um, and then, but then to do this. And when I, when I got, when I got back, when I got on stage, it, when and when I get on stage, it's like going back home. It's 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 just a phenomenal feeling, and 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 also to create for others, um, and to create so that you know you can see that that you there's a, a direct interaction with the audience. Because when somebody's reading your something you've written, you know they're reading it. You don't know what happened, whether they liked it, how they responded, mm -hmm. unless they come up and, and and tell you. But when you're when you're watching. When I'm on stage, I'm also watching, I'm also interacting with the audience and I'm watching them and I'm like, my goodness, it's direct, it's visceral, it's immediate. Um, and, and I just, I just, I just love that. Yeah. Um, so I had to move because real life, there's like one socket in the room and my computer was dying. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. I was like, can't find the socket. Um, but why theater? So like I said before, I think I, I dabble a lot in different mediums and I'm really interested in different media. And I, though, hopefully the better I'm getting, I don't know if it's better, maybe it's just older. Um, the older I'm getting in the craft, I, I am beginning to get a deeper instinct as to what it's gonna sound. I, I always feel like ideas come from outside and there's a universe that's just filled with ideas and one decides you, that you're the one to do it and you don't have a choice. And so you just have to make it happen. And I'm becoming better at discerning when an idea is for what medium. And with, and when I was trying to process, understand that for myself, I realized the thing about theater that's so exciting to me is I don't think there's any medium where the audience comes in with such a suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. Like by definition, you are sitting there looking at some wood blocks and they're like this is ancient blah 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 and this is a mountain and it's a castle it is really not clearly to everybody's eyes and yet you're there and the audience is there with you and that total by the nature of the form that complete suspension mm -hmm. of disbelief means you have a range i don't think even a novel or a film or a tv show can do because the audience gives you a really specific permission to create anything you want in their own mind. And that's kind of, it's kind of nuts. It's a little bit narcissistic. It's very power giving. You feel very powerful when you're on stage. You're just there, you're like, yes, I am a goddess. And they're like, yes, you are. It's crazy. <laughs> and it's, it's, there's something about the space that an audience has for story 
mm. that mm. theater has that I don't think can be replicated in any other medium, which is why some stories must begin on the stage because maybe, mm. maybe in the content, maybe in the form, maybe in the idea behind or the meaning, the thing that it needs the most is for the audience to already believe before you've even began. And theater gives you that which is why some of the most revolutionary work can happen on stage. It's why Brazen, about six revolutionary women had to begin on a stage. It wouldn't have been believed as easily on film or <laughs> read as well or as a textbook or even as a novel. It had to be on stage. It had to be with 300 people sitting there being like, I believe you, tell me. Mm. Um, and that's, it's, that's the gift that theater gives that I don't think I found in, an, in other mediums. And each medium has its own gift, but theater is, Theater's audience and the relationship with audience is so powerful and unique that I know I'll always find myself going back to that space. Mm. Yeah, it's, there's so much trust, right? There's so much trust and faith that is blindly put on a theater maker. And mm -hmm. it's profound, it's very profound. And it bestows us with so much responsibility. And uh, it's a very large undertaking and there's a, big sense of, I have to do this because these many people trust me. Um, it's a power giving feeling for sure. And, and, and as I said, a huge responsibility. Uh, for me, uh, why theater? Because in my religion, we have soul to soul connections and there's very many gestures and even through classical Indian dance, many hand gestures that suggest that one is giving their soul or showing you a part of their soul in some way, shape or form. That freedom to be able to do that in a human form uh, without disrespecting whoever's up there watching us is, is only found on stage in this, not stage, but in the theatrical space for me. Um, it is so liberating and it is so change making. I think it really is the tool who will change the world. Every revolution started with culture. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, the face of the world that, that we see in this moment needs culture makers, you know, and I, and, you know, I've also been thinking a lot about what it means to be a woman in, in, in this field and this society and, and, you know, stereotypically, but appropriately in some way, shapes or forms, women are, are, are seen as the culture keepers in families, the, the ones that will raise the children with culture. Uh, and that's what it feels like in the theater world also as a woman, mm. you know, it's, we are culture keepers and that's what changes policy. That's what changes the minds of presidents, the, the minds of powerful people, because everyone is equal when, it come, when you come to this space, you know. And you all seem to be attracted to the idea of the musical theater. Is that, you feel this is the strongest connection to a, to a co contemporary form of performance <laughs> from, from your history or from your background or your interests? Yeah. I mean, I just love musical theater. I have loved mm. it. When I speak of suspension of disbelief, musical theater specifically <laughs> is actually insane that everybody happens to know the number in harmony and is dancing to a rhythm. It's crazy. I love it. It's so good. And the tradition we've come from music and theater mm. were not separate things. Yeah. Right. I, would, I don't think they're separate, distinct. It's hard for me to yeah. imagine them as separate things. And mm -hmm. there's, there's ways which we've learned through the mentorship at MCI. There's ways in which a, a note will do so much more for you than all the words I could Im ever imagine writing. Working with someone as talented as Wanja Wahoro, these times we've, you know, we've written a whole thing and we've collaborated. She's also a co-creator and writer on the project and we'll write a whole section and it's brilliant and beautiful and she'll go away and come back with a chord progression. And it's like, that's everything we're trying to say for the last four pages. So <laughs> there's no point to that. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's a, I think for me, it just comes from, a deep, deep love of the form. And this is not just the American form, but like just the form of music and story told together from mm. our history and others. And then the ability to work in a form that that music, that music does a thing that words can't and speech can't. Mm. And it's beautiful mm. 
to work with people who know how to utilize that in storytelling. I I, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, Morab because you know the tradi our tra our, in our traditions they're not separate separated. Mm. The words, the music, movement, dance, it's all, all part of, of story to how you tell a story. Um, and I think one of the things I love about this, this course is the, that, that this program that we're on is, is how um, committed the, the NYU, um, uh, Deborah and Carl and, and, and Roberta are to, supporting us to create our own voice we're not follow you know we're not copying anything american you know so mm -hmm. so it is it is really just giving us uh tools um that that we can then use to explore and create um our own in our own way you know so empowering me to create in my own way and if you look at the projects they're all so different mm -hmm. um you know my my project is is called Escape, and it is um, it's actually based on a story. I was listening to a pro we have a, a, a an FM radio station called Ghetto FM, and I was listening to a story about a true story about a young man who escapes from prison, but ends up in the prison uh, warder's home, the chief prison warder's home, and then is hidden under the bed by the prison warder's wife very young. I mean, I okay, there, there's some basic things that are, are true, but that apparently happened. But then of course, I've, I've recreated it. And it's, a, it's I use um, my co creator is called um, she's, she's, a, she's a, a very well known hip hop. Um, and she's a, a poet herself. And she is my, um, yeah, my composer. And, and, and so she so the, 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 the musical is in Sheng, which is a language, a, a very a youth language among young people in Nairobi, um, certain parts of Nairobi. It's hip hop. It uses traditional musical instruments, like I always they always following me, um, as well as Western instruments. So it's in it's also in Kiswahili, um, you know. So it's combining all these things that um, that 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 are, are creating something different and something new. And, and I've gotten incredible support from for it and, and courage you know, to, 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 to mix all these weird genres together um, um, from, the, from the program, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, I really uh, like what our mentors say about tools and not rules, but particularly for this reason. I, I personally come from an experimental dance-based background um, and the that influencing the creation of work feels so inherent just because that's the way we tell stories here. Uh, you, you, you can't you won't have something without the, you know moving your hand or moving your leg, moving you know moving a part of your body differently uh, and, and delivering that in, in some way or form. And it's a very community based tradition, you know uh, And so that's been that's been really, really, for me, the, the way I, I see musical theater as the form. Uh, and I think it's interpreted in, in so many different ways all over the world. I think every tradition has its own version. And um, this sort of cross-cultural exchange within the musical theater context, uh, from, an outside, from an observer perspective, and then also uh, from an insider perspective, has been really interesting in bringing out what that means to us in our context. What's musical theater for us? And, and being able to have that space whilst also respecting the age old traditions and forms that are present everywhere else around the world has been really profound. Mm -hmm. It really shapes our understanding of our own self and our own form um, and places it in the global theater canon in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. and what musicals do you look up to? What musicals do you like? The ones we might know. Um, okay, my actual favorite musical is an animated film. It's um, that I met before Christmas. I can't, I, it's not even like the fanciest or whatever, but that movie makes me weep every time. It just, I don't know what it does to me, but every time he's just like, but I want to be Christmas. I'm like, but you're Halloween. And I just get really like emotional <laughs> every <laughs> single time. Um, I, I, one, 
maybe now that I'm learning because of MTA, I might be able to crack the formula that it hits. Um, but I don't know why that's the first one that came into my head <laughs> that, I, mm-hmm. that I can't let go of. Mm-hmm. How about you guys? I'll think of I'll think of smarter answers after, but that's actually oh, my that's favorite awesome. one. It's the Tim Burton movie, or uh... yeah. Yeah, 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 the Tim Burton he produced it. Yeah, it's oh, it's so good. It's so good. Mm-hmm. It's so it's so ridiculous. It's insane. And again, it I, I'm, I guess maybe if I was a theorist, I'd be really thinking deeply about the suspension of disbelief because it's not, <laughs> not just a musical; it's an animation, also about Halloween. It's it, the, nothing about it makes any sense. And here I am, like weeping at at my age without fail every single time. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of stuck between two: one for more sentimental value than the other. Um, it was my childhood dream to watch Lion King on Broadway. And New York was never a thing in like this life plan of mine. Uh, and so when I went to New York for the first time, I was lucky enough to watch that with, on Broadway with my mother. And Wait, I weeped through and the, the Lion King on the Broadway. Lion. Okay. I weeped, I weeped like a little baby having seen theater for the first time because it just, it just did something to me, you know, to, to, to hear, to just, yeah. It just did something to me viscerally. Um, and then also learning about, you know, Tamor's practice and how she used mask work and how her, her practice was really informed by research in, in, um, in mask work from, from Asia. So uh, that, and then the other one, I would say more, more from a, an aesthetic perspective um, would be Fiddler on the Roof. And I watched it in Yiddish with super titles mm-hmm. and one of the American classics, of course, but uh, just the, the big the tradition. Robert. Just what a wonderful <laughs> opening, you, yeah. Uh, the Jerome Robbins version you saw, uh, the original, or? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so for me, there's, there's uh, several. Um, uh, I think one of the ones that I really enjoyed way, way back was one, is, I think it's called Once Upon an Island. Um, set in the Caribbean, I think that I just, I just, some friends of mine produced it in Nairobi, and it was just delicious, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, Serafina, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I was just about to Absolutely. say, I was like, oh my God, Serafina. Yes. Exactly. Serafina. Serafina. Of so good. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good. And then, and then, and then Evita, uh, that I really mm. loved, and also. Um, uh, of course, Jesus Christ Superstar, because for some reason, Kenyans are constantly producing that. I mean, I think I saw it when yeah. um, my, my, sis- my, my, my kid sister was in it. And, you know, she was, you know, I think she was in high school or something like that. Um, yeah, so, so those are the ones that uh, I remember for now. So yeah. Jesus Christ is a superstar in Kenya. You know, it's always being yeah. produced in Nairobi. Yeah. <laughs> they produce it, they produce it will last be year, the year before. It's very popular. It has yeah. to be written. And what an interesting moment, I think, and normally traditionally, um, uh, as uh, Karishma would say, you know, people try very hard to get on Broadway and to get a company and to be part of that commercial machine. But you said, no, I go back and with some help and we do our own creation. So it's a decentralization um, of uh, theatrical uh, productions, uh, ways of productions. And also, as you all say, but as I hear it right through, the telling the stories of the Kenyan women, telling your own stories. You, and um, even so in a way one could argue, you say it's not uh, uh, the American uh, movies or American musicals, but it's the American dream, which actually encourages you to do your own thing, you know, uh, to trust in yourself. So it's still that, but it's a good, I think it's a good, it's a good uh, impulse and an inspiring um, um, you know, moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just want to throw in there, you know, I think as, as we've been thinking about um, the performative landscape, there's this idea of we don't get to see enough of us on the stage. And that's a very big thing globally, right? We talk about yeah. um, w- yeah. what it means to be a person of color in the States and how we don't get to see ourselves represented in the space as, yeah. as much. But I think also for us here in Kenya, it's, it's not only not being able to see our own stories on stage, but also just the access of having to make that happen is much harder than to say, put on Greece. And, yeah. and mm-hmm. that's a code that I'm, st- I'm still thinking about this and thinking about how do we crack that exactly? Because it's not only our stories and our representation and seeing more of ourselves on stage, but it's also how do we make that possible for our audiences? 
first? And then how do we think globally? Because work from the region can easily be picked up by Americans, by Europeans, and that's really important because our voice and our stories need to be told on a global platform. But I think the, the, miss, the, the middle step before that global thinking is really how do we get our fellow Africans to see it? You know, how, how yeah. what festivals are there in the region? Um, what stages, what touring structures, what, what other um, resources do we have to see our own work? I yeah. think that's a different kind of empowerment of, oh, my fellow African did this, so I can do it too. Mm. Mm. And do you feel that the, the, the kind of COVID time, the Corona time will create a new form or something coming out that might be, or you're thinking about things that would be different than before, or do you think you really use the time to finally do what you would like to do? Um, I think it's, it's, I think it's got to be like a, a kind of mix of both. I will say, mm -hmm. and thank you for Karishma for raising that. I think this space particularly, which is why it's really, really difficult for anyone to give a one liner of what they do, is on top of being a creative, you are a producer and a marketer and an industry shaper and a policy maker. And, and you have to be because it is, <laughs> it is an emerging industry. It's a growing industry that right. definitely is better than it even was five or 10 years ago, but certainly is nowhere near, does not have the infrastructure that is required for anybody to very confident, confidently state what I do is playwriting. It's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so how do you make money? Like those become two separate <laughs> questions. And so, yeah. It's, so it's, it's just the fact of it. And so I think what's happening is there is going to be, for those privileged enough where you have enough so social security, housing, shelter, food, water, such that you have the, the privilege to pause, I think it's going to give mm -hmm. those people a lot of space to revisit old work and make it stronger. It's going to give people a lot of space to make new and innovative forms of theater, like what Sitawa and Alea are going to do on Thursday. Um, it's, there is going to be a little bit of both, but I'm, I'm also interested in this as an entrepreneur. I'm really interested in this space in that way, because the need for innovation is not just about creative innovation. It's literal material survival innovation. If people yeah. who, are not, who are privileged and who do have access to calls like this, who have internet and electricity at 7.30 p.m. on a Monday in their comfort of their house. If people like that don't find ways to make economic sense of the situation and provide and create economical in infrastructure in a country that many times feels designed against creative economics, then we're not going to survive enough or long enough to make the work that needs to happen. Like it's just not going to happen. So. The challenge, it's the, this is the joy and difficulty of working in this space is that it is not enough to be creative. It doesn't matter how gifted or incredibly talented you may be um, and how hard you work in that space. You must also entrepreneur, you must also find funding. You must find a way to sell. You must find a way to make it make an income for people. And that forces you to be incredibly innovative. Like insanely, ideas will come from anywhere because you have to. And because if you don't, you m can barely survive. And if the industry doesn't shift and you have in a position where you can create an industry shift, then thousands of people won't survive. The burden is really different, I would say, in that way, not from individual practitioners, but just on a, on a scale of what it means to practice in a country that does not have a social safety net if you do not survive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. totally agree with that. I, uh, I, I, I hardly think that there is much. I mean, I, one of the things that happened um, at the beginning of the uh, lockdown is the musicians that I work with needed support. You know, they, you know, I have other things I can do. I, you know, other revenue streams that I can, I can, I can create and they didn't. And so one of the things we did is that we had a show on Instagram yeah. to raise some money so that they could send their, their families up country away from the city so that they can they can survive, right? Um, so you, you know, you're alluding to something, um, uh, Mora, that each one of us, um, we may be privileged, but we're actually supporting, we are the infrastructure that supports yeah. a whole lot of other artists, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, 
okay. you know, I literally, I, I'm, I'm constantly always looking and saying, um, oh great, there is, there is a um, Lamb Sisterhood. So the Lamb Sisterhood for me are really important because uh, there's another center of creativity and there's another center of creativity. And how can we then support each other um, to continue th this journey um, even as we are interacting, you know, so the, the, in the, within the region, we have, you, you know, Uganda. Uganda has a, a theater festival. I know that Karishma, you're involved um, uh, in, in that as well. Um, so yeah. it has a theater festival and it's been incredibly useful for me because I've written plays and then um, taken them to Uganda to an audience that um, doesn't know me and, and, and so, um, can judge what the play that I've performed and, and say something about it um, and then and then help me develop as, as an artist. So you're getting out of your comfort zone, out of your yeah. comfort country and into, um, um, into the region. I've also, last year I was in Zimbabwe, which was fantastic, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm hopefully going to continue with that kind of interaction with um, Zimbabwe. Yeah, so really the, the, the mm -hmm. growth and expansion. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, there's a lot of good things that have come out of this time in, in, as we think about shaping the sector in that, you know, we're all of a sudden able to be on these Zoom calls and have online engagement from various, you know, uh, parts of the world. And I think the question will become how we can preserve that uh, going forward when things get back to normal without losing sort of authenticity, the soul to soul connection that exists within the actual theatrical space and within, you know, regional travel where people can go to different festivals. Um, and the Musical Theater Initiative uh, took four pieces of works in progress to the Kampala International Theater Festival last year to do exactly what um, uh, Sitawa was speaking about with one of her pieces, you know, get that feedback, be, be uh, exposed to an audience that, that the piece is not uh, the, the piece is foreign to, you know. Um, and so I think the question will really become how we can maintain both. And in many ways, theater companies and organizations, I believe will be taking on more media-based roles, entertainment-based roles versus just solely doing theater, which if we think about it, mm -hmm. is very much in line with what we're talking about as being Kenyan performers. We do everything, a little bit of everything, because that's how we are. Yeah. Uh, but to Mara's point, Philanthropy, investment, philanthropy, investment, philanthropy, investment. This is, I think it's so, so important for our Africans to invest in African culture because we're lucky enough at the moment to be getting funding externally. But we, I mean, I really, I really hope that this moment um, increases the corporate world's eyes or uh, a show opens the corporate world's eyes and the philanthropic world's eyes to. The, the, the power of their investment in the cultural sectors of their respective countries and governments as well. So to I, need to, I, need to, mm -hmm. I, I need to say something about uh, investment, Karishma. Um, there, there, that is happening. There is, there's a, for example, a fund called the HEVA Fund, HEVA Investment mm -hmm. Fund. Yeah. These, these mm -hmm. are extraordinary people. They yes. um, yeah. um, spent as, as last few years testing on themselves and a small group of people um, whether whether it is possible to make a living through their art. And then, and then now they've expanded. I'm one of the beneficiaries of, the, of their investment in my theater company. And of course, now this is quite unfortunate because it was supposed to all happen this year um, <laughs> because you know, I, got, I got the investment last, last, uh, the end of last year. And, but fortunately they, they are very um, understanding. Yeah. And so I'm so I got a loan. I'm supposed to pay back because I was supposed to have you know I had various uh, performances lined up, um, you know. But 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 it is happening, and 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 I just mm. find that really extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Heva is actually a really great model by which a lot of other yes. you know there's Heva, so many other organizations, Safe Source in Uganda, um, that are kind of starting up on that path and are already there right. and have established that infrastructure. So the more the better, right. you know. Yeah. And it is the truth that societies that work, that functions, have great art, have great theater. You want to see how great a democracy works, how great a society how great a community is look at the theater. Are they supporting it? Do people go out? Do they enjoy it? So it's uh, important to support because it 
represents uh, so it's the be very best and the surplus of energy and some money and how to mm. use it that's why life is worth living and um, I think in that symbolic space that imaginary space which is also real it represents something and to hear that from Kenya speaks so greatly that Kenya something is happening also politically mm. that they are able to fight this crisis they have young artists and established artists collaborating so it's a fantastic news um, we, we, we hear out there. So um, we're coming to a close and uh, since we have three guests, normally often we have one, but we thought it's to give a little bit of the variety of uh, that kaleidoscope of Kenyan work uh, by women. Um, um, we thought it would be better to have all of you, but what, what advice do you have for young theater makers? What advice do you have for our audience? How should they use this time of Corona? And maybe, yeah, we start with... Uh, oh. An and then Karishma and then Sita. Right. Okay. <laughs> With me? Wow. Um, no advice. No. Um, I don't know. I'd say in general, general advice would be like just make art you believe in. Even if it's commercial, even if it's it's forget like about those that those kind of contract constructs. Like if you believe in it, like really and truly, like that's something you believe in then everything else will be figured out um, because there's so much that's beyond our control. You, know, you should study, you should practice, whatever, but ultimately if you don't believe in the thing you're putting out, somebody else will feel it. So just make art you believe in, I guess is the only thing I can say. And about this time specifically, I'd say just get through it. A friend called me and was like, and your surviving is a day job right now. It's a pandemic. And I constantly have to remind myself we're in a global pandemic <laughs> like it's not it's not an incidental thing this is an unusual time if you if all you can do is survive that is wow well done and if you can read a little every day you can watch a little bit of something that helps you you can make a little bit of something and it gives you joy that's great if you're making the greatest tome of all time that's also fantastic like release yourself from the idea that you have to be or do a certain thing other than survive in this moment and make art you believe in. Yeah, I uh, have to agree. I think your health, your family well-being really comes first. And I, I couldn't emphasize that more. I think, you know, in order to be the best version of yourself, and I've learned this the hard way, personally, uh, in order to be the best version of yourself, you've got to make sure you're okay. Whatever that means, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of it, you know. Um, for those that are religious, pray. If that brings you closer to any sort of self, you know, um, care. Uh, and I think care for the people around you. You know, I think that's a really big mm. part of this because we really are a village uh, and the self will not be okay if the people around us are not. So, you know, reach out to, reach out to people. Uh, and I think that applies professionally also. You know, I think this time you should be focused on building relationships no, I, I, I will still remember a week ago, Satao just called me and it was the best conversation we had uh, just because we talked and talked and we just, it was so great. Uh, and, and it's those moments that I think will stay in, in, in my heart and in, in, in the hearts of those that you reach out to. So if it were to be like an assignment, uh, reach out to someone you haven't spoken <laughs> to in a while. Uh, you, you, may just, you might just make their day in a different way. Yeah. So for me, I would say several things. Number one, this is a time to rest. Um, actually resting. You've got permission to take afternoon naps for real. You, it's surprising how much, how much you hold in your body. It's, it, it actually is very, very surprising. Um, uh, you you know you look like you you made some of you may some people may look like they're not doing very much but but we are we are under we are in a in a global uh, pandemic and that is a that is a big deal. I think the other thing is that observe I would say observe, pay attention because although we although we're in a global pandemic there's certain things that have stopped. There's also a huge uprising and 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 you can see that like 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 for me one of the things that I'm seeing is just the how fragile our systems are. Our economic yeah. systems are so fragile. Our, 
our political systems, our, you know, religious system, everything is so, you know, we, we, think we, we think we've been sitting on a, you know, great big, you know, things. We haven't, we, you know, we, we, we don't have great <laughs> civilizations. We've got fragile civilizations. Pay attention mm -hmm. to that because that's the source of writing. That's a source of creativity. I remember during the post-election violence, I did my best writing. And actually in, yeah. in, in, in times of upheaval, that's, that's the greatest, that is the time that is the most productive when it comes to creativity. For some reason we're able to, it's like um, a scales are lifted off your eyes and you're able to see and then, and, and, and th therefore, this is actually the time for artists. It's the time for, for being creative. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. in addition to the creativity, rest. Yeah. That is really, really significant and a great um, advice. And, um, and it's very encouraging to hear that also from you and uh, also to uh, not notice to the other world where we live in here to um, um, see that uh, the way how you are dealing with it and that you are creating new forms and that you are uh, enlarging the existing networks, existing ideas to create something new that uh, you're using a different uh, old uh, tradition, but perhaps with technology, create a form that hasn't been there before with music people haven't heard before with words people haven't heard before. And uh, so great to hear, you know, also that again, going back to the Sundance uh, East Africa project, you know, how how much uh, input that had. And it's fantastic to see uh, Philip Christopher and Roberto did and then the NYU um, uh, workshops with Eric, that there is something that lives on that they uh, so give like in uh, science, uh, physics, you give impulses and the energy in a way stays. And how great of Robert Redford who created a film festival, but also so theater is important. And then, you know, decades, decades later, something happened. He had no idea about people might not even know his name anymore, but they might know the Sundance Festival or the Sundance Theater Institute. So um, it is stunning. And um, I really would like to thank you for sharing the moment, sharing it together. And it was beautiful to hear you all speak and the sisterhood you represent. And, uh, and uh, can't wait to come to Kenya one day and see your work or you're yeah. in, the, in the US. So. At the seal, we will go uh, uh, around the world again this week and uh, uh, stay with us. Uh, tomorrow we have Emily Monet and Greg Hill. Both of them are from Canada. They're indigenous artists. Uh, she's Emily, a playwright and uh, also director. Greg Hill is the curator at the Museum um, of Indigenous Art, the National Museum. And we're going to hear from them. How is that going in Canada? How is that uh, COVID crisis, the Corona crisis and the time of Corona? impacting artistic lives, the life of the country, the cities, and what is uh, changing there. We hear from Japan, from Tokyo, from Satoko Ishihara, a young emerging playwright, a brilliant mind, very original, authentic work, um, still emerging, but uh, someone who observes, as you, as you all said, you know, and it's, uh, mm. Tava said, this is what we should be doing and put it into a form. Um, on Thursday, Nigel Smith, who runs the Flea Theater, and took it over and, and uh, is now in the middle of the COVID and Corona storms and upheaval and Black Lives Matters and uh, is navigating the ship, his own in his life, but also this of his, his theater. And we will hear from him, how does that feel like? And uh, all the forces and on Friday, a veteran, a significant uh, artist, uh, Jean-Claude van Italy, a playwright who wrote in the 60s, most people, a lot of people say the most significant anti, Vietnam war play done at La Mama coming out of there was done by Jean-Claude from Italy who uh, went on to write many other significant plays and, uh, and also has a retreat now in upstate uh, New York where he sings we also have to focus on, uh, on meditation and connect to a spiritual side of theater so his whole journey of life we will go back over and I'm really interested to hear what he thinks about this uh, also unprecedented time of corona so thanks for our audiences for listening. I know we went a little bit over time today, but I think it was well worth it. it <laughs> already, uh, um, uh, it should be much more time and we should listen more. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, but I think we were able to get an idea for an idea and congratulations on all your work. And yeah, thank you. Go out there, do your, thank you. your, do your thank work you. and the world is uh, listening and interested. And this is important. And also to keep in mind that 
it is affordable. Broadway in New York, uh, the family with three kids wants to go and they take subways or taxi and then they eat there out of a thousand dollars. It's unaffordable. <laughs> People can't do it mm. anymore. Um, so, um, so something also has happened here that is against the basic idea of participation, the access to arts, healthcare, and education, basic human rights uh, forms aren't working. And we all hope that this crisis also will push us to find better ways and better forms as you did. So thank you all. Thanks for HowlRound again for hosting another week of Siegel Talks at uh, uh, Emerson College. I think they had no idea that we would go on for so long and the survey <laughs> audience now they're in, they cannot say no, it's too late. Um, and uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Vijay and Sia and Sun Yang and Andy, my Siegel team, thank you all and to the really to the Listeners, thank you for taking your time. This is so important that Karisha and Sitava and Ann uh, Mora, they know there are people interested, people are listening, and perhaps also there's something inside it that might change your life. And after all, this is what this is all about, that we all as citizens, as part of the uh, community, that we change, that we do an authentic change. And artists really can help us. And what they said, to rest, to observe, to be authentic, and to, to, uh, to connect and get through it day by day. Nothing lasts forever, not the good things, but also not the bad things. So one day this will be over and I hope we all will be ready for a better, better way of uh, spending our time on planet Earth. Thank you all and to our audience. You. And you stay safe. Thank you. Wear a mask and uh, uh, yes. thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.